changing the world of work for women everywhere. We are Watermark. We're the only nonprofit women's leadership organization that spans all industries. We connect, develop, and advocate for the advancement of women in the workplace. The Watermark community includes senior executives, entrepreneurs, and emerging executives that support you not only at the top of your field, but also on your way up. All right, what's one question that you might ask? <laughs> Tina. What is the biggest challenge or problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, what is the biggest challenge or problem that you're trying to solve? It helps you learn more about where that other person is coming from. You might be assuming that budget is the biggest constraint, but maybe they're working on a deadline, and they need to make sure that that project gets completed by then. That's a great question. What other questions might you ask? What's your key objective? What's your key objective? Right? It's another way of asking what's most important to you and learning more about what it is that the other person truly values. So there's many ways that you can use open-ended questions to engage. And you learn, you learn more about what you may not have thought to ask for. So if you phrase it as a closed-ended question, is your key objective x or y? They might tell you one of the two because that's what you asked. But it might be that their actual priority isn't anywhere on that list. And sometimes they discover it themselves through the process of sharing with you. How many of you had, have had that experience of you're trying to solve a problem and you're talking to a friend or a colleague about it, and in the act of describing the problem, you figure out the solution? So it's not that the other person is trying to hide their objectives from you or not wanting to share. Sometimes they don't know themselves until they've gone through that process of talking with you answering these open-ended questions, they may not know themselves what it is they really want until they've had this conversation. Stage four negotiation, stating positions. So this is what you're looking for. How can you share that with your counterpart in an effective way? So state positions. Most of the time, we have less information than our counterpart might have. We might not have all the information that we need about the, a particular situation that we're going into. When, you, when that is the case, it is very helpful to see if you can get your counterpart to state their price or their position first. So a great example of this is if you're looking for a new job or if you're negotiating a salary increase. Chances are the company knows a lot more about the salary range and what they're willing to pay than you might know. Because they have access to all of the salary data for all of their employees doing similar jobs. They know the value that they expect that position to bring. And they usually have a pretty good sense of what their budget is going to be. It's still important for you to do the market research and know what you're worth, but know that many times the other side will still have more information. And in that case, it's helpful to ask them or have them share with you their thoughts around the salary range or figure before you share your number. Classic examples are MBA student who did a fantastic job negotiating, got maybe 30% than they were originally asking for and feel pretty happy about that offer only to start and within the first week find out that everybody else in the same job is making 20K more than they negotiated because they didn't know what the range was. So see if you feel like you may not have as much information as the other side, it is helpful to let them share first so you have some idea of what that range might be. And then if, if you're able to get that information, then the next step is to give your counteroffer. And many times, this is, I'm generalizing, of course, not every woman is this way, but I find a lot of the feedback that we get is, as women, we're hesitant sometimes to feel like we're asking for too much. We worry about damaging the relationship. We don't want to be seen as coming across too pushy or too aggressive. So we negotiate against ourselves, and we tone ourselves down. And we ask for less than we think we might deserve as an easy start. So challenge yourself. If you think that's likely to happen to you, see if you can, when you make your counteroffer, give the 
highest salary that you feel you can justify, give the lowest price that you think you might be comfortable with. And for most people, going outside of our comfort range is something that we could stand to do a little bit more of. Right? Most of us are too far in that comfort zone and would really benefit from stretching that a little bit. Do not practice this for the very first time at your high stakes promotion discussion. Start small. Go to the farmer's market and 20 minutes before closing, see if you can practice stating a price that normally would make you think this is crazy. There is no way that they would ever agree. Just try it and see what happens. Worst case, they say no, and you walk around the farmer's market and then sheepishly come back and say, OK, I'll pay your price. <laughs> What's the price of a little embarrassment for picking up a new skill and learning how to be comfortable? So set, you can set this as a challenge for yourself. How many no's can you get? Can you get 10 no's? Can you get 20 no's? It is harder than you think. Because when you ask, many times people will surprisingly say yes to you. They'll go out of their way to find a way to help. So get comfortable with giving an offer or a counter offer that is outside the range that you might naturally start with. I wonder if there are circumstances where you want to propose the price first. Because it sounded like from what you're saying, the reason to get the counterparty to say their price first is because you're still data collecting. And so using that information as a point to determine what reasonably you can come back with. And so if it might, if there are other ways in which you can collect that information, it might, if it might make more sense to first propose mm -hmm. a price. So yes. therefore you're kind of controlling that range. Yes, that's right. So the question was, are there ever situations where it's better for you to propose the price first? If you're in a situation where you, you have the better information about what the market can bear, for example, you are either selling a commodity or providing a service that is very much in demand, and you know exactly what people are willing to pay for it. And for example, it might be a premium service. So you want to start high and set that expectation right out of the gate. And that can pull people all the way to their upper limit when you start with that high anchor. But it's very helpful to know what that acceptable range is. Because if you put out a price that is too high, and it's so high that it's completely out of the acceptable range for your target market, you may not even have an opportunity to have a negotiation. Right? They might just say, no, I, I can't afford this, and not even come back to you with the feedback. So when you know, when you have the data, and you have a very good feel for what the typical acceptable range is, it can be very powerful to start first and say, this is what the price is to set that expectation. So like with many things, whether it's negotiation skills, influencing, or really leadership or any kind of communication skill, there's rarely any black or white. We will rarely say, always do this or never do this. The reality is there's a range. There's more effective most of the time less effective or effective much more rarely or some of the time. And what we try to do both here and in all of our classes is give you a variety of different tools that you have in your toolbox so that you can use what is appropriate for the situation that you're in and knowing when to use what approach. So get comfortable. Practice in low stakes situations until you get comfortable stretching your comfort zone. As you think about stating your position, remember what we said about focusing on others. It is not about you saying, this is what I want, and this is why I want it. How does your offer benefit your counterpart? Can you state not just your position, but their position in the way that they themselves would make their case? So you can, in that case, you would leverage existing conditions, things that you know about your situation that would benefit your counterpart based on what you learned from asking them questions and confirming what you heard. Use the information that you gathered all throughout the process. It's not just one, one step in the negotiation. I've asked my questions. I tick the box and I move on. You're gathering information all throughout, even in the way that people react to your offer. And stress time, feelings, and money. So in business, these are the three benefits that are most often most important to people. Nobody wants to go into a negotiation with you and say, I want you to waste all of my time, make me feel bad, and spend all my money. Right? So these are the things that people look for in somebody that they're working with. 
Stage five of negotiation is bargaining. This is the, another area where oftentimes we all feel a little bit outside of our comfort zone. So your bargaining process, really it starts when you're planning your currencies and then this becomes what you use when you start to have that interaction or that back and forth. Frankly, if you do a fantastic job at obtaining information and building rapport and empathy, you may never even need the bargaining stage because when you make your request, you can do it in such a way that the other side wants to give you what you're asking for. But if you find yourself in this situation, then the currencies that you strategized become your potential concessions, potential concessions for you and for your counterpart. So for example, in that if you're searching for a new job, working on a promotion, it might be the job title, the timing, the time off, scope, or support for your professional development. Make condition, concessions conditional. Another area where I often get feedback from, particularly from women who don't have a lot of negotiation experience, because we want to keep the relationship positive, sometimes we're tempted to just give and give and give concessions and hope that we get something in return. Hope is not a strategy. <laughs> so one way that you can teach yourself to be able to get something back for the concessions that you give is to use language that is conditional. Rather than saying, I'm going to do x and I hope you'll do y, instead you might say something like, what if I then would you? So what if I agree to lead that project and we deliver it successfully? Would, then would you feel comfortable being able to promote me on the timing that we talked about? So, or suppose we da 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 da, then could you X, Y, Z? Or if I were to do X, if I were to buy three packs of roasted maple almonds, would you be willing to give me 25% off? Right? And when you say it this way, it's very clear to your counterpart that they are expected to give you something back in return. And you haven't committed to do whatever it was that you offered. You put it out there as a thought, but you haven't locked yourself into doing it. Right? So if I say, if I were to buy three packs of maple roasted almonds, I haven't said I am definitely buying three. Right? So that keeps your leverage and your negotiating power as you explore the different potential outcomes that you might have. So if this is something that you haven't often done, this might be a good thing to practice in the coming week. Again, find a low stakes situation and practice there. My husband is here tonight. He's helping sell copies of our book. And these are, when you're at home and you're trading off chores, these are another great, great ways to practice concessions that are conditional, right? If I take care of the laundry, will you manage the dishes, right? Or if I drive on this trip, will you pick the restaurant, right? So these are small, easy ways to get in the habit of getting comfortable with using conditional language. Stage six of negotiation, where, where we would all like to get to, is agreement. And although I say it's stage six, it's really just the beginning of the next phase, which is implementing what you agreed on. So for this first cycle, which is negotiating and getting to that first agreement, you want to end on a positive note. Ideally, you'd like both sides to feel that they're better off as a result of the deal. Because remember, no, having no deal is better than being stuck with a bad deal. You want each party to feel that they were treated fairly throughout the process. And you want to be able to carry out the agreement successfully. It means nothing if you both agreed and maybe even signed a document if afterwards it falls apart because somebody feels they were strong-armed into it or they feel that they were pressured to commit to something that they can't deliver in the end. So when you make an agreement, you want to make sure that it holds up and that you are able to successfully get it implemented. You want to be in a place where you would negotiate with your counterpart again. You would feel positive about working with that person again. It doesn't mean you gave them everything that they wanted, right? They can respect you and have a good working relationship with you, even if they didn't get everything that they asked for. You would work with your counterpart again. It is very rare that we work with, pers with a person just one time in our entire lives or in our career. You never know, the world is pretty small. 
when there might be another opportunity for that person to do you a favor or be involved in another interaction with you. And even if you may not work with that specific person again, you might be working with other people from that department, from that company. Your reputation precedes you, and you want that reputation to be a good and fair and strong reputation. Document, put the terms in writing. So many well-meaning agreements, even consensus in a meeting, oh, we all agree these are the next steps, can fall apart after the meeting when people maybe leave with different interpretations of exactly what was agreed. So it can be helpful to put those terms in writing so that it's, a, first of all, it's in black and white. If there are any differences in understanding, you can surface them and get them resolved. And also so that you have something to come back to afterwards as a reminder of what you agreed as you are moving things forward. Alyssa, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I was curious where the balance is. Because I, I get it, we all want to be liked, especially women. We always want to be liked. We want the person to want to negotiate with us again. And I think that's where we start to become a little bit softer on our bargaining. Mm -hmm. And how can you I guess that's maybe the magic question, but how do you find that balance? So she's talking about the struggle between wanting to be liked and being able to be effective. And I personally feel like being liked isn't necessarily an either or. It's not just being liked or being effective. The people who are the most effective are the ones who can negotiate with you, drive a hard bargain, and leave you feeling like they did you a favor in that <laughs> conversation, right? Because you love to work with, if those people are fantastic because you love to work with them. You'll tell everybody about them. And it is, when, I, when we think about how we interact with others, having a positive interaction doesn't always mean you are their best friend or that they think that you are the most amazing person to ever walk this planet. If you leave them feeling like they're better off for having worked with you and that you treated them fairly throughout the process and they can respect working with you, that's what you're looking for in that outcome. It is not necessarily that they're going to be your buddy or your best friend. And that is something that we sometimes have to watch out for. We can be so worried in our own minds about what does the other person think about us? And we carry this little invisible voice in our heads that says, if I push too hard, if I ask for this, maybe they won't like me. Right? And what I, what I find as I'm going into that is, in the end, people are there for a purpose. Right? It's a business. We all have outcomes that we need to achieve. And if you roll over every time and give people what, the, what they want and you never get what you want in return, those agreements are ultimately not enforceable. It's not sustainable. You can't keep doing that. Either you may find that you eventually aren't able to deliver on what you committed because you're not getting what you need out of that agreement. Or you may find that when you go back to your boss or your organization, somebody else will say, we can't do this, right? This is not acceptable. Or you may reach a point when you're negotiating for yourself that you think, I felt like I wasn't, in the end, better off for having made this agreement. You may feel resentful of the other person. And that doesn't bode well for a long-term working relationship. So it's easy in the moment to try to smooth things over and think, oh, everything is smiles and butterflies. But it is not what helps you in the long term. So just keeping that balance in mind can be good for making sure that you don't go too far off in one direction. So the agreement is just the start. You want a, an agreement or a consensus that is enforceable, that can be carried out and can be implemented, and that people feel good about putting into practice when you leave the negotiating table. So set goals and close. In a moment, I will wrap it up. I'll have you set some goals for yourself individually, and then we'll open up for more Q&A as a group. So what have you learned? We touched on a whole span of many different topics. As I said, we sort of crammed the overview of, of a whole day into the space of, of about 55 minutes. What's one thing that you learned in the session that you can take away and use? What's the most helpful insight that you heard? Um, the importance of language and the words that you choose and the, the effect that it has 
mm -hmm. setting the tone of the conversation for any of those spaces. Great. The effect of language and the tone that you use. So the words that you choose can make a big difference in how your message is perceived. In fact, the tone is also very critical. There is, some of you have heard me quote before a study that was done by the psychology department at UCLA that talks about how people form first impressions. Many of you might be familiar with that. They looked at what percent of somebody's first impression of you or your message comes from the words that you say. Who knows what percentage it is? It's a pretty famous study, so many of you may have come across it. 7%. So 7% of people's impression comes from the words that you say. The rest, 38% from your voice, tone of voice, how you say things, 55% from your nonverbals and how you carry yourself. So many times that's what we react to. Have you ever seen two people in a meeting where you're the third party and you can tell they are saying the exact same thing in different words? <laughs> But because of their body language, they are just butting heads, and they are arguing with each other, and they leave that meeting feeling really stressed, upset, angry at the other person. It's their body language and their tone of voice, even though they are making the same recommendation, saying very similar words. What else? What was helpful for you? Um, the preparation and the strategizing. Mm -hmm. So strategizing beforehand. Yes, using open-ended questions. So asking what makes you say that, or what is your biggest priority? What makes this a challenge for you? Rather than saying, why can't you do this, right? Or can we do this? And just asking, what's the concern? I think the assessment is really powerful because it gives you, it makes you realize that you're there to give something. And obviously, what you're willing to give up is very clear to you. But then that's where you draw the line. Yes. So I think that knowing that about yourself is very, very important. Great. So knowing that about yourself, you're there to, definitely you're there to, to give something. It's helpful to have a little bit of flexibility, but also reminding ourselves that we're also there to get something, which sometimes we aren't always as successful or don't find, why can't you do this, right? Or can we do this? And just asking, what's the concern? Yes. So I think that knowing that about yourself is very, very important. Great. Right. So knowing that about yourself, you're there to, definitely you're there to, to give something. It's helpful to have a little bit of flexibility, but also reminding ourselves that we're also there to get something, which sometimes we aren't always as successful or don't find as easy to do. So using that framework with the language helps put you in that mindset to think about what can I give that's important to the other person and what will I ask for in return, or what might I ask for in return? Practice. Practice. We forget that practice is so important in business. Um, you know, we do it when when we train to run a marathon or when we train to do a yoga pose or whatever, and, and we forget that in business we also need to practice. Exactly. Um, in low stakes situations. Great. Practice is critical. Any soft skill, any communication skill, Practice is so critical because I can stand here and share all the concepts and all the theory with you. I can point you to some really great books, which are a fantastic read. And you could spend all your time reading those books and still leave not a much more effective negotiator than you were when you started. Because what happens is in the moment, you need those skills to be there in your muscle memory to be natural and comfortable for you so that you can use them effectively. And that only comes with practice. So just like we wouldn't expect any of us to be able to run a marathon immediately on our first day of taking up running and buying running shoes, <laughs> the same, it's the same with negotiations and the same with leadership skills. Start by practicing in low stakes situations. Start by practicing one thing at a time to say, OK, for this week, I'm going to practice just asking for what I want, making a request. If you don't even ask, if you never negotiate at all, you've said no to yourself before you even started. Or I might say, this week, I'm practicing asking open-ended questions. So I will make sure to ask questions that start with what or how instead of could you or will you. Or choose, there's so many things that we talked about today. Pick just one thing right, and start with practicing that. 
So create a game plan. What's one thing that you will ask for in your next negotiation? One thing that you, one request maybe that you've been wanting to make that you can try? And what's one thing that you will do differently in that next negotiation scenario that you're preparing for? So at the bottom of your handout, there's space for you to write notes about that. Based on what you learned today and the insights that you heard, what is one thing that you'll do differently in your next negotiation? And you can use that blue focus on others card that we passed out to remind you in those moments what questions you might ask or what might be helpful. I have a couple of clients who carry that card around in their wallet and sometimes have seen me at an event and, and have said, Shang, I need a new business card because I've been carrying this around for two years and it's kind of beat up. So because they use it in conversations. And I have a friend who has it taped to her monitor or pinned at their cubicle. So these are helpful questions to ask. One thing that you will do differently. Shang, I have a question for you. Yes, Mary. As you know, off the wall. So, so much of our communication is over the telephone and over email. What's your view on that when you're trying to do a negotiation? When you are negotiating, I find in person, of course, when you have the opportunity is very helpful because then you see that body language and you can build more of a personal connection. If you can't do that, I would go to the phone next as the best choice because it's still interactive and it gives you an opportunity to learn more about the other person and what they're looking for. Email is tough and the reason I say that is because there is a limited amount of exploring and obtaining information that you can effectively do in email. And sometimes, some of us have a habit of getting way too much in our own head and write this long email that is, OK, if you would do x, then here's what I might do. And then here's the next thing that might happen after that. And it's just too much information. And it may be going down the wrong path. Because if your first assumption at the very beginning is not correct, then that whole email just makes the other person think she doesn't get it. Right? So when you can, if you can't meet in person, pick up the phone or see if they'll meet you on Skype or WebEx or Zoom. We have so many technologies available to us today. If you can see the other person, that is always helpful. Bindu. You're going, to, you're going to say this is too simplistic, but my number one answer is more practice. <laughs> more practice is helpful to make things become more natural. And the more important the conversation, the more practice you need. So if you are negotiating a $100 million contract or a promotion that's really important to you, don't let your meeting with your boss be the first time that those words leave your mouth. And also, don't let that conversation be with that person be the first touch point that you have with them. Right? The more interactions you can have with that person beforehand, it helps to build the rapport and it helps you remove your own fear about working with that person or speaking with them. You may not always have the opportunity to do it, but try and find every opportunity that you can right? to get yourself immersed and that will help to take away some of the fear. What else would be helpful? What, uh, going back to the climate, setting, setting the tone and climate, what if, what if you go into a negotiation with a partner or a collaborator that says, I needed to have it in this price or else the deals are off. So how would you approach that kind of, that kind of tone or that kind of climate that would set a front with them coming into the negotiation? So when you're working with somebody who says, I need to have it at this price or the deal is off. Is that person on your side or the other side? Because it can happen both ways, right? Yeah, yeah. if like our colleagues in, in the local region or that salesperson representing the company that they're trying to sell to, like, what kind of conversation at that table? 
Okay, so it's somebody on your own team that is saying, we need to get this at this price or we can't do this deal, right? One place that I would start, of course, every situation is a little bit different, but one place I might start is by asking, what makes you say that? And way before you go into the client meeting together, right, to ask, what makes you say that? And that will tell you a little bit more about what is driving that need. And depending on what they say, you might respond a little bit differently. So for example, it might be that that salesperson has a quota that they need to meet. It's end of quarter. If they don't make that deal at that number, they won't get their bonus. So that might be one motivation. Another motivation might be they are doing another deal with the same client, and if they offer a lower price here, then they have to offer that same price on the other side. So the more you can learn about why they have that, that need, then you can figure out the appropriate way to deal with it. One question that came up, I taught this workshop at one of the tech companies in San Jose last Monday. One of the questions that came up was, what if there's somebody on the other side who is just being a jerk? No matter what I put in front of him, no matter how reasonable the solution is, he is just shooting it down and pushing back and just being impossible to deal with. No amount of facts or logical reasoning is going to get this person over to my side. And I said, yes, many times it's not about what is logically the best solution. There's a big emotional component to it as well. And what that tells me is if the person is reacting that way and they are shooting down solutions that seem like they would be rational for both of us is I haven't gotten to what they really want. And what this person maybe wants is a sense of control over what is happening. The sense that they are the decision maker in making the choices. And if I know that, then I can figure out how do I help them feel like they have that control? What can I do to help them feel like they are driving this deal, that they can take the credit for making it happen? And that becomes one of the currencies that I can offer. I can make the other person feel, help them feel good about the role that they're playing in this deal. So knowing that, and that kind of stuff, you won't find out by asking, straight out asking them, right? Many times it comes from observing their body language and under, being able to really put yourself in the other person's shoes so that you can figure out how to move forward. Maybe one last question and then we'll wrap and turn over to Marlene. Okay, maybe one from here and one from here. Well, I think my, my question to more about is what if you come to the negotiation table as a, with a collaborative approach and the person you're negotiating with comes with a competitive approach? What, you know, how do you, um, how do you level set that, I guess, or, or change the, the, the style of the other negotiator? Right. So what if you come to a collaboration with a come to a negotiation with a collaborative approach and the other person comes with a very competitive approach? Every person is a little bit different, but sometimes when that happens, coming back to currencies, some people want their negotiation to be competitive. They feel like they haven't one, unless they've squeezed every last concession out of the other person. So in those cases, again, knowing that, you can adjust, right? What can you do to help the other person feel like they've won and that they've gotten everything that you could possibly give? It doesn't mean you actually have given everything, but how can you help them feel that way? So think about applying for a job or buying a car. If you go to have the conversation with your hiring manager and you put your salary number out there, I'm just going to make it up. Let's say you say you want 195k, and the hiring manager says, "Sure, no problem." How does that make you feel? I should have asked for more, asked for more right? <laughs> so sometimes just knowing knowing that, then you can plan appropriately. Don't give everything right away because the other person needs to feel like they got it out of you. Right? So that might be one way to handle somebody who's approaching it in that very competitive style. So some of it is knowing who your audience is. And a, another one of the things that we do, I know it, it might sound like I'm talking a lot about the full day class, but one of the things that we do in our influencing skills, workshop and negotiation skills is we have a four style quadrant of different communication styles, different negotiating styles. How do you work with people who are a very different style from you? How do you flex more effectively to that other style? One last question on this side. Uh, my question's around qualifiers. 
Mm -hmm. So, like in a salary negotiation, bringing up things like, if I know people make more than me, or market values this, or other things like, if you were going to negotiate rent, which I know wouldn't happen around here, saying like, <laughs> I'm a great tenant, or we didn't really talk about bringing up things like that. Mm -hmm. Is it because it's a bad idea, or should you do that during the bargaining stage? So those are some of the existing conditions, or in some cases, there might be currencies that you can offer. So for example, you being a great tenant is an existing condition that would make a landlord, most landlords, feel pretty positively about you. And if you know that you've been a great tenant, then you might come prepared with letters of recommendation from your former landlords, maybe pictures showing the state in which you left your last apartment, or if you know that your landlord or the seller of the home cares a lot about family, maybe their kids grew up in that house and they feel very emotional about it, then you might come with a picture of your kids in a letter and talking about how you're excited to be putting down roots and finding a forever home. So depending on how much you've learned about the other person and also how much you know in general, landlords always appreciate good tenants, right? What are some of the things that people are universally looking for that can help you come prepared as you share your position and as you start offering concessions or pointing things out, the best way to introduce what is most relevant to that person. So you don't want to spend time offering things that the other person doesn't care about. They may, it just may make them feel that you don't understand them. So it's helpful to know first, obtain as much information as you can, and then based on what you've learned, introduce what's relevant from the currencies and existing conditions. So, Thank you all very much for your engagement and the interactive discussion. I really appreciated that. I'd encourage all of you to connect with me. My email address is up here, and it's also on the handout that you have. Um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find because I'm the only person on LinkedIn with this name. <laughs> so if you search for Ching Valdesco, you will definitely find me. And if you'll mention that you were at the Watermark negotiations talk, then I'll know to accept your LinkedIn request. And also, I would encourage for the folks who are in the South Bay, I'm teaching the full day version of our influencing skills class on April 25 in Santa Clara, near Great America, so near where 101 and 237 come together. So if it would be helpful for you to learn more about influencing styles, and more importantly, to get some practice with a real life scenario, we'll ask you to each bring what's a business scenario that you're working through, maybe a tough meeting that you have coming up, you will actually role play that conversation with a partner and then you'll get some feedback from me and from the rest of the group and you will get to see yourself on video so that you can see the impact of your body language and how that might be affecting how the other person is reacting to you. And so I'll share that there are the other reference that might be helpful. We all have different learning styles. Some people learn by listening. Some people learn by talking things through. For those of us who learn by reading a book and going back to it re repeatedly until it sinks in, I can recommend, for sure, Chris Voss's book, which is called Never Split the Difference. And then outside, um, my husband's at the table with a book that our firm has written and published called Simply Said, Communicating Better at Work and Beyond. So that is also very helpful and contains some great examples of language that you can use to change things from very me focused to how might somebody else say it. So a quick, very quick example of that if you'll allow me before we close. If you are a manager, you're leading a team, you inspire and motivate others your challenge is how do you get other people to want to follow your vision? As many times you can't force them to, right? So how might you use that focused on others' language? So instead of saying something like, I believe in hard work, which is really still in the end about me, I might say something like, you want a leader who works as hard as you do. Who is that about? It's about the other person, right? Or if I say, I want us to be known as the best structured finance team in the country, or I want us to be known as the best structured accounting firm in the country. Who is that about? Also about me. So I could say, you want to be part of a nationally respected and recognized team. Right? That makes it, what can you do to make it about the other person? With that, thank you all very much for your time today. And I'll